Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you very much for this day. We thank you because of the peace you have granted us. We thank you for the privilege of coming together to worship you and to celebrate the glory of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for gathering us together here. We thank you because unto you shall the gathering of the people be. We come, Lord, to study your word right now. We bless your name for all that we have learned already since we came to this service. We know that the entrance of your word gives light. And your word is a solution to every problem in our lives. Therefore, Lord, we pray that today you enlighten us and you teach us so that you grant us solution to every spiritual problem, every physical problem in our lives in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to concentrate on your word and to hear what you have to tell us today. Lord, we pray that your spirit will speak to every heart present here today in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that through the light of the word, you will dispel and drive away the darkness of doubt and unbelief. So that, Lord, we can stand firm in your word and we can receive the fulfillment of all that you have made available for every one of us. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we come to Romans chapter 4. And we're looking at Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. These are very important verses. And it is important for us that we pay attention. Please open your Bible. We're going to read together. From Romans chapter 4, verse 13. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law walketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith, that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure, to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God who quickness the dead and called those things which be not, as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. If you notice very carefully and clearly those verses I've read to you, you will see that two words are very prominent. One word is promise. Look at verse 13 for the promise. In verse 16, it says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. At the latter part of verse 14, it also mentioned promise. So you will see here you are thinking about the promise of God. The promise of God made unto Abraham in particular. Verse 16, the latter part, it says, To that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And so it describes the life of faith that Abraham lived. His great expectation through faith. 
the word faith is mentioned a number of times too. You will see that in verse 12, it mentions walking in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. Also, the latter part of verse 13, it talks about the righteousness of faith. It goes on in verse 14, it tells us that if it were by the law, verse 14, faith will be made void. And then it goes on in verse 16, it says, therefore, it is of faith. In verse 18, it tells us that against hope, he believed in hope, still referring to faith. In verse 19, he was not weak in faith. In verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. But then we are told in verse 20, he was strong in faith. Then it tells us that characteristic of faith in verse 21, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. So, the title of what we are talking about today is God's Promise Received Through Faith. God's Promise Received Through Faith. This is quite wide and quite deep. Because God promises a lot of things to the children of God. And we are learning a lot of things from the faith of Abraham. In receiving the promise that God made unto him. God's Promise Received Through Faith faith. Now, I need to tell you something about this topic. Although God has given us a great promise, as great as God himself, without faith, it will appear as if we have nothing, because we cannot receive anything without that faith. It is that faith that links us with God and makes us recipients of the promises of the Lord. And from the passage I've read to you concerning Abraham, you will see there is so much for us to learn from God's dealings with Abraham and from Abraham's response of faith unto God. God's promises to Abraham were so great, in fact, they were out of reach for the natural man. It took constant unwavering faith on the part of Abraham to receive the, pro the fulfillment of these promises. We too must walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham if we expect to obtain the fulfillment of God's promises unto us. I've divided the uh, verses that we're looking at today to three parts for clarity and for ease in understanding. Part 1 is from verse 13 to verse 16. God's promise to Abraham and to his seed. God's promise to Abraham on the one hand and God's promise to the seed of Abraham on the other hand. Part 2 is from verse 16 to verse 21. The description of living, possessing faith. That kind of faith that is alive, not dead. That kind of faith that possesses, that receives. Description of living, possessing faith. Point number three is uh, from verse 22 to verse 25. Full redemption today through unwavering faith. You see, these things are written for us so that we too, we will be able to receive the promise of full redemption. All that the Lord has made available for us through unwavering faith. The kind of faith that will not waver, that will not allow doubt or unbelief, but will be strong in the Lord so that we can receive from the Lord. Let's go to point number one. God's promise to Abraham and to his seed. We we'll look at this again in Romans chapter 4 from verse 13. Romans chapter 4 verse 13. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law but through the righteousness of faith for if they which are of the law be heirs faith is made void and the promise of none effect because the law walketh wrath for where no law is there is no transgression therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. These verses are very important. You know that the primary target of Paul the Apostle was to convince the children of Israel that it was not through the circumcision, it was not through the works of the law, but through faith that we receive the promise of salvation. 
of justification, of redemption in the Lord, of relationship and reconciliation with the Lord, of eternal inheritance with the Lord. He also wanted to assure the Gentiles in Rome that they too could come, that they didn't have to go through the way of circumcision or through the way of obedience to the law of Moses, that just as they were, they could come, just as I am, I come unto thee. And just as they were uncircumcised, without the record of obedience to the Mosaic law behind them, they could come and be heirs of the promise of God. But he makes use of Abraham as an example. In verse 13, for the promise. He, he referred to a particular promise. For the promise. In fact, this promise was a promise made unto Abraham. And the promise had many areas or many aspects to it. But then he said the promise that it should be, it should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. He was explaining to these people that Abraham did not inherit the promise because of the law. In fact, the law took 400 years before it came. God had given the promise unto Abraham. And he was to inherit it through the righteousness of faith. Then he tells us in verse 14, For if they which are of the law be heirs, that is the circumcision, that is the Jews, that is the people that were seeking to please God through what they could do on their own. If that was the way that uh, Abraham or anyone received the fulfillment of the promise, Paul the Apostle said, faith will be made of none effect. The promise also will be made of none effect. Then he said, because the law walketh wrath. What he meant over here is that if they had been obeying the Lord, if they thought they were going to inherit the promise through the obedience of the law, the day they disobeyed the Lord in any way, then the wrath of God will be upon them. Because the law knew of no mercy, knew of no grace. That's why he said, because the law walketh wrath. For where, where no law is, there is no transgression. Then he tells us in verse 16, Therefore, it is of faith. Therefore, the receiving of the promise is of faith, that it might be by grace to the end, for the purpose, the promise might be made sure to all the seed. That is, as it was made sure to Abraham, it will also be made sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, that is, the father of the Jews and the Gentiles, the father of us all, the father of the circumcised and the uncircumcised, the father of all the people that will walk by the faith of Abraham. Look at verse 12. The father of circumcision to them, who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. Already from the verses that is 13 to 16 I spoke about, I've spoken about the promise and the faith. Because really you see it is very difficult to separate both. God gives the promise and then we receive by faith. But for clarity in our study, we have to uh, make a difference between those things and break them. So, I'm now going to concentrate on God's promise to Abraham and his seed. God's promise to Abraham had many parts, or it had many aspects. Number one, it concerned a land. Number two, it concerned a people, a nation. Number three, it concerned a blessing. Number four, it concerned a redeemer. Take them one by one. The promise God made to Abraham involved a land in which Abraham would live and which would later be given to his descendants. We must go back to Genesis chapter 12. As we look at this aspect of the promise of the Lord unto Abraham. Genesis chapter 12 verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Unto a land that I will show thee. Then in chapter 15 of Genesis, verse 18, 
In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying unto thee, unto thy seed, have I given this land? And then the Lord described the land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, river Euphrates, the Canaanites and the Canaanites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gagashites and the Jebusites. You see, the Lord gave a promise of land, extensive land unto Abraham and to his seed. The thing you want to notice here is that it was when Abraham had nothing. God promised him much. He had nothing. God promised him much land. Number two. The promise also involved a great people. A great nation that will come out of him. People who will be so numerous, so great in number that they could not be numbered. In Genesis chapter 13. Verse 16, Genesis chapter 13, verse 16. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Please remember once again that at this time, when God gave the promise to Abraham, he had no child. And yet, God promised much when as yet he had nothing. He had no child. God promised him children as numerous as the sand on the seashore. In Genesis chapter 15 verse 5, And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, If thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. You see, God promised him much land, when as yet he had no single acre of land. He had nothing, God promised him much. And God promised him that he will become a great nation, that will not be able to be numbered for multitude, when as yet he had no child. Number three, God's promise to him involved a blessing for the entire world. Through Abraham's descendants, God promised that the blessing will affect the entire world. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12 from verse 2. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This third aspect of the promise of God unto Abraham tells us that when he was nothing and he was not known except in the little corner of the world where he was he was promised that he will become a blessing to the entire world from nothing to everything. Now number four, the promise also involved the giving of a redeemer who would be a descendant of Abraham through whom the whole world will be blessed by the provision of salvation. By the provision of salvation. God promised that through Abraham will come a redeemer that will save all people from their sins. All nations, all families of the earth from their sins. You can see here God promising Abraham something spiritual. When he was at, as yet not spiritual himself. But God called him and then God gave him the promise that through him spiritual blessing, salvation will come to all the world, the whole of the world. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed what the promises made. It says not and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as one, as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now you can see all these things that the Lord promised Abraham. If we were to summarize everything, much land when he had nothing, many people when he had no child, a blessing to the entire world when it was not even much known in the corner of the world it was, a redeemer spiritual blessing when as yet he was not spiritual himself the single word you can think about will be impossible it looked far out of reach it appeared that it was impossible to be fulfilled and yet this was the promise of the lord 
And it is in the same way you look at the promise that God has given unto us today. The promises God has given us are so far out of reach. In fact, they appear incredible. They appear uh, improbable. They appear impossible. And yet, the Lord has given us this promise. But you must remember that when God made the promise to Abraham, it looked like that. The land, the people, the blessing to the entire world, the Redeemer coming out of him for the entire world. It looked impossible. And yet, that was the promise of the great God unto Abraham. Do you know that God has given us promises like that today? That when you look at these promises, it will seem unbelievable, incredible to start with. But then, as you remember the faith of Abraham, and you also manifest that same faith of Abraham, you will see that what God did for Abraham, the same thing he can do for every one of us. Let us look at a few of the promises that we have in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 and for this cause he is the mediator of, it, of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption for, of the transgressions that were under the first testament they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance here we are still in the world and the Lord is giving us the promise of eternal inheritance far beyond the reach of the human mind far beyond the reach of human ability far beyond the reach of what we can say we can even have in fact some of us that do not even possess temporal inheritance little things here in this temporary world god is giving us the promise of eternal inheritance that means that if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the promise he's making to you will even stretch far, far into eternity. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 from verse 71. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers. And to remember his holy covenant, the oath which is swear to our father Abraham that he will grant unto us that we have been delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life again look at the promise that he has given us here first of all what i read to you in hebrews is giving us the promise of redemption from our transgression the forgiveness the peace of god the salvation of the lord and he has also given us there the promise of eternal life, eternal inheritance. Now, he's promising us something here in Luke chapter 1. He talks of being saved from the hand of our enemies. Of course, when the children of Israel read that, it meant for them being saved from the hands of all the nations that hated them. To them, that will be unbelievable. Because for centuries, they fought against the Philistines, against the Assyrians, and the many other nations held them in captivity. And then God was giving out a promise to them that seemed unbelievable that they could be saved from the hands of all their enemies, of all that hated them. For us, it means that all the things that are negative, sin evil doing even the corrupt nature god is able to save us from everything he gives us total salvation complete salvation he saves us entirely but not only that have you seen that verse 75 and you see the scope the extent the height the depth of the promise of god it seems unbelievable to the carnal man to the natural man because it reaches so far beyond human ability he says that we might be able to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him even to be holy before your fellow human being how about that you, you know how difficult that could be naturally the wife to even be holy before the husband or to be holy or the husband to be holy before the wife for us to even maintain holiness irreproachable holiness that nobody can point accusing finger to before our neighbors you know how difficult it is to the natural man and yet this is saying that even before god who is greater than men and angels that he will grant us that we will be holy and righteous before him then it says not just temporarily for a week but all the days of our life 
is bringing back the very life of Enoch, making it available to everyone. That from the moment Enoch knew the Lord, 300 years without interruption or hindrance, he lived holily, righteously before the Lord all the days of his life. And that that was possible for Enoch, God now makes available for everyone. You see that sanctification? That's holiness and purity of heart. That you can be so holy before the Lord. That there is no outward sin and there is no inward sin. And you are totally made holy in the sight of the Almighty God. What a great promise. An unbeliever will stagger at that. A person that is carnal will say, that is incredible, that is impossible. But you see, just like that for Abraham, God promised him a land when he had nothing. God promised him a great people when he had no child. And God promised him that he will be a blessing to the entire world. When as yet, nobody knew him, even in his little corner. And God promised that a redeemer will come through him that will be for the salvation of the whole of the earth. Incredible, improbable, impossible. And yet you see God fulfilled it because Abraham was able to believe in the Lord. Here we are told that he will make us holy and righteous before him all the days of our lives. And this is telling us that if we too will believe like Abraham, it will be fulfilled for us as well. And not only that, there is much more. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, verse 38 and verse 39. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, can you think of how, uh, how great this is? Far beyond the reach of man. This is the Holy Ghost. The third personality in the Godhead. The Holy Ghost. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The children of Israel were familiar with the gift of land. And the gift of material things. We've been studying our Monday Bible studies now. How God gave them the gift of manna. Food that they ate for those 40 years. And we'll uh, some be studying. In fact, tomorrow we shall be looking at how water came out of the rock. But you see here, we're talking of a greater gift, a higher gift. The gift of the Holy Ghost. Power from on high. Anointing of the Holy Ghost. You see, it will so come upon the sanctified vessel that a language he never learnt before, he will speak that language. Again, to the carnal mind, isn't that impossible? Isn't that incredible? Isn't that far beyond the reach of the human mind? But then that is the promise of God, exactly as it was even for Abraham. It says that ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off. You see, even if it, if it were for just a group, a little group of people, that would have been far beyond the reach of man. But then it is for you Jews and for your children who will be Jews and to them that are far off Gentiles and many centuries after the, the, from the first time it was spoken, as many as the Lord our God shall call. You see, the point here is this. Salvation is so great. It's so great a promise of the Lord. Sanctification is so great in magnitude promised by the Lord and the Holy Ghost power and anointing is so great for the sanctified vessel that it will seem unbelievable and yet it is still the great promise of the Lord for us who will want to believe in the Lord. Well, the climax of everything, the summary of everything appears to be Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 3. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I've read those two verses to you. But you know that they are so great and so deep. Again, I want to tell you and remind you, it is so far beyond the reach of the natural man and the natural mind. Look at some things here. It says, according to his divine power. The promise he makes unto us is so great. It is not according to human ability, even human receptivity. It is according to his divine power. 
What has he given to unto us? In that verse 3, he has given unto us all things. All things. All things. Now when you think about that, that God has so made provision for the Christian, I wish we knew this. I wish we could understand this. That God has given unto us all things. All things in what way? It says all things are pertain unto life and godliness. It is uh, now making uh, uh, two different things. It, say, it says our life is a spiritual life as well as a natural physical life. And then it says God has given us according to his divine power. He has given us all things. All things pertaining unto the natural life unto the physical life and pertaining to the spiritual life unto godliness then it says through the knowledge of him all you need to know is to know him and then all these things will be yours that has called us he has called us to what to glory and to virtue naturally we are, we, we are people of shame because all that sin has come short of the glory of god but then it says now because of fear of this promise he has given unto us glory and virtue then he says in verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great, exceeding great and precious promises. If you were to pick those words one by one, you could say he has given us promises. Not only that, he has given us precious, precious promises. He has given us great promises. He has given us exceedingly great and precious promises. You see what God has given us? In fact, those who do not live the full Christian life. It's because they do not know what God has given. They do not know the extent, the scope, the depth, and the height of the promises of God. He has given unto us literally all things pertaining to life and godliness. He has given unto us great and precious promises that are very, very great. In fact, he says, by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. You see, the human being, because of the fall, appears to have the animal beastly wild nature you can see from the behavior you can see that the human being that doesn't know christ is is like is a partaker of the devilish satanic nature you can see from the life from the deception from the evil from the wickedness man has a beastly animal satanic devilish nature but then it says by these promises he has given us we are now made partakers of the divine nature and then he says, having escaped. Can you think about that? Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It says all the corruption in the world. It could drown a man. The corruption in the world is as deep as the ocean that could drown every human being. Until you don't see every any human being at all because everyone is so drowned in, cor in the corruption in the world. But then God has given us promises that will make us to escape the corruption that is in the world through laws. These are the promises of God. I've shown you a few of these promises so that you will know. As God promised Abraham something great something high something far beyond the reach of the human mind and something far beyond the reach of human ability in such a way in the same way god has given us promises concerning salvation concerning sanctification concerning the holy ghost baptism in fact concerning all things that pertain unto life and godliness and all these things are available to you and to me today if we will have faith in the lord let us understand you will inherit all these things not by power not by might but by my spirit says the lord it is by grace you will believe you will understand that these great riches are at christ's expense that is christ has made them available so that now the moment you believe on the lord these things will be yours if you will not look at your circumstances, if you will not look at your weakness, if you will not even look at your human nature, you keep on looking unto God, then salvation will be yours. Because it says, look unto me, all ye the ends of the earth, and be ye saved, says the Lord your God. But then everything hinges on faith. Everything hinges on faith. That is what leads us now to point number two. Point number two, which is the description of the living possessing faith of abraham and this is to show us how we too can have such faith as well in fact what we're looking at today is so very important because 
it is through this living faith this possessing faith this active faith that we can inherit the promises that god has made unto us of all things pertaining to life and to godliness description of living possessing faith in romans chapter 4 from verse 16 therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace this is very important all the promise god has made unto us the promise of salvation the promise of sanctification the promise of holy ghost baptism the promise of healing and deliverance all other promises god has given us it is by faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be made sure to all the seed that the promise might be made sure to all the seed everyone without exception not to that only which is of the law but to that also which is of the faith of abraham who is the father of us all as it is written i have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed even god who quickness the dead and call it those things which be not as though they were now you will see that when god promised all these things they were not in existence for abraham and yet god was looking at them from afar up because a thousand years was the lord like a day what will happen in a thousand years time god could bring everything back and see it at that point you see jesus had not come at that time but then the thing that will happen hundreds of years to come in the coming of jesus christ as uh, the seed of abraham god could see it ahead of time he called those things would be not as though they were in verse 18 who against hope believed in hope this is not telling us the quality the characteristic of the faith of abraham he hoped against hope that he might become the father of many nations if you want the promise to be uh, to be fulfilled in your life you'll need to hope against hope according to that which is written which is spoken so shall thy seed be then it says in verse 19 and be not weak in faith he considered not his own body now dead if your faith is going to be strong there's something to consider there's something not to consider you consider god the supernatural one you consider the promise that will never fail you consider the power of god that is able to fulfill and perform all that he has promised there are things you don't consider you don't consider your own weakness you don't consider your own inability you don't consider your own circumstances and situation and be not weak in faith he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old neither yet the deadness of a, of sarah's womb he staggered not at the promise of god through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to god and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness now you can see the way abraham believed in god he believed in god to the point that he will not doubt anything at all and this is what god is calling every one of us to he wants us to believe in him we are ready to you already in verse 16 that the promises of faith that it might be made sure to all the seed and you are part of the seed you are one of the seeds that it might be made sure to you also as one of those people that walk in the stead of the faith of abraham in this passage which we have read and explained a little paul the apostle lists certain characteristics of the faith of abraham the kind of faith that results in the fulfillment of the promises of god that is the kind of faith that will grant us salvation from sin that will grant us righteousness in this present world that will grant us peace in our heart and peace with the lord in fact the kind of faith that will grant us healing whatever the sickness may be the kind of faith that will grant us deliverance whatever the affliction or the oppression might be the kind of faith that will grant us holiness holiness of heart holiness of life holiness of thought holiness in every way the kind of faith that grants us sanctification circumcision of heart purity of heart the kind of faith that gives us victory dominion that we're able to overcome everything that the devil may try to plan against our lives the kind of faith that gives us not only life but abundant life the kind of faith that grants us protection power 
fruitfulness. In fact, the kind of faith that grants us answered prayer. Whatever that prayer might be, that is based upon the will of God, upon the word of God, upon the promise of God. So we're going to look at the characteristics of the faith of Abraham. As we look at these characteristics, I want you to note that it is possible for you and for me. And if you will learn these seven characteristics I'm going to give you now through these uh, verses I've read to you, and you will apply your heart to them, your life will never be the same again. Now, as we look at these characteristics, let's look at them one by one. We're describing the characteristics of the faith of Abraham. The kind of faith that's alive and the kind of faith that is active, that possesses the promises of God. Number one, Abraham's faith was faith in a God who sees the thing completed before its commencement appears to human eyes. Before the commencement of that thing appears to human eyes, Faith sees it completed by God. Look at verse 17 again. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickness the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. You see, God calls the things which be not as though they were. God sees the work accomplished finalized, completed, before it even appears visible to human eyes. That is our God. And we children of God should have that kind of faith. You know what Jesus said? Have faith in God. The original says, have the faith of God. The kind of faith that God possesses. And that means that even before you see that thing accomplished, you will, you will believe it. Isn't that what we see about Abraham? When as yet he had not even placed his feet on the land, he believed that he would have that land. When as yet he had no child, he believed that the Lord will give him the child. Not only that single child, the Lord will give him children that will be innumerable. Now the second characteristic. Abraham's faith was faith that believed in spite of every sign of failure. Look at verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. You see the faith of Abraham. He believed in spite of every sign of failure. He continued to believe in the face of growing improbabilities. Despite the seeming impossibility, he believed hoping against hope. You see, this is the thing for those who really need to get saved. You don't get saved because of your feeling. You see, your feeling might tell you, do you think you are saved? You see, your own mind might tell you, do you think you can ever get saved? Your own weakness might tell you, do you think you can ever get saved? You believe you're hoping against hope. In spite of the signs of failure, you say, yes, I believe. Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. It is for me he died. If I were the only one to be saved, I know that I must get saved. I believe the Lord. In the face of growing improbabilities, I believe the Lord. He died for me. I accept it. That settles it for me. The same thing for those who need to be healed. You see, maybe you have sickness in your body. And it appears that the doctors are telling you that it is hopeless. The kind of faith that receives the fulfillment of the promise of God is the one that will hope against hope. In spite of every sign of deterioration, every sign of failure, every sign of, ne of uh, something negative, every sign of growing improbability, you will tell the Lord, I believe your promise. You will never fail. I hope against hope. Let's go to point number three. That is, the third characteristic of Abraham's faith. Abraham believed God without becoming weak in faith. His faith did not weaken with the passage of time. You see, when God gave him the promise, time was going. Year came, year went by. And yet, he was still believing God even through the passage of time. His faith prevented him from becoming discouraged by his own natural weakness. Look at verse 19. 
and be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. Yet when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he wasn't walking by sight, he wasn't looking at the wrinkles on his face or in his body. He wasn't looking at the fact that he didn't have this in his body, he didn't have that in his body, or the fact that now it had taught to be with Sarah as it will normally be with women that will be able to have children. He hoped against hope. He was not weak in faith at all. The same thing in our lives, when God has given us a particular promise, and it's appearing that uh, the body is telling us that the promise might not be fulfilled. Or, it, or we, are, we are being told that all the circumstances around us they negative they negate the positive attitude of our faith yet you are not going to allow discouragement you are not going to allow your natural weakness to take over you keep on believing the lord number four abraham's faith was a faith that expects the supernatural expecting the supernatural he knew that this was not beyond the reach of man beyond the ability of man his faith kept looking at the promise not at discouraging appearances natural impotence was no problem to abraham because his faith was in the supernatural god who had created him in the first place number five abraham's faith kept out all unbelief Unbelief will try to come. Of course, unbelief may try to knock at the door. The devil may bring suggestion, but Abraham's faith kept out all unbelief. You see, if you have been afflicted in your body, and you are looking for deliverance and dominion, and you know the promise of God, this son shall follow them that believe. It says, in my name, they shall cast out devils. Another passage tells us, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by enemies hurt you. Another promise tells us that Satan shall bruise Satan. God shall bruise Satan. God shall bruise Satan. Almighty God shall bruise Satan. Under your feet shortly. You see, this promise of God that God has given unto us, we need to understand we must not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. The devil might say, do you think you can ever overcome? Do you think you can ever have dominion? Do you think you'll ever be able to have the fulfillment of the promise? Faith does not entertain doubts. It has no anxiety. Faith has no anxiety. Faith has no complaints. Abraham's faith was absolutely assured. There were no ifs and buts or perhaps or maybes concerning his faith. He was fully persuaded. He was fully persuaded. Number six, Abraham's faith was in the omnipotence of God. He believed in a God who was able to perform what he had promised. His faith was in the eternal, eternally unchanging faithfulness of God. In verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Number seven, Abraham's faith was the kind of faith that believed until it received. Not, not just that he believed for some time, but he believed until he received. True faith never fails to receive the promise. And what does he receive? He receives what has actually been promised, not anything else. This is the description of faith we find in many parts of the Bible. Time will fail me to be able to read to you all references concerning faith like this. Let me read one or two. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 27, Acts chapter 27 verse 25, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be, even as it was told me. If you could read the whole chapter, you will discover the predicament and the difficulty of Paul the Apostle here. They were on the sea, and the storm was raging. In fact, they had lost hope of safety. They thought they would all die. They were already, I mean the mariners and the people, the crew in the ship, they were already casting their wares and their victuals, their food, into the sea. For many days, they didn't eat at all. Fear and anxiety will not allow them to eat. Then eventually God gave a promise unto Paul through an angel that he sent to him. 
and told him that he his life will be preserved not only that all the people that sailed with him would also be secured and now Paul the Apostle testified and said, I believe God, it shall be even as it was told me. What kind of faith is that? Faith that sees the safety accomplished before its commencement, before it even appeared to human eyes. All those people were Paul the Apostle, they couldn't see it, but then Paul the Apostle saw it through the eyes of faith. Number two, it was a kind of faith that believed in spite of the sign of death, of destruction, of failure. You see, all the signs around Paul the Apostle was a sign of death, of destruction, of failure. But in spite of all that, Paul continued to believe. Number three, it was a kind of faith that was not weak. That faith was not weak. He believed in the Lord. In fact, he began to eat to encourage the people. He said, it shall be so. It shall be so. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. He said, it shall be so. He was not weak in faith. In fact, it was a kind of faith, number four, that believed in the supernatural. Because, you see, all natural efforts were failing and already failed and they didn't know what they could do it was a kind of faith that believed in the supernatural that god who created the sea was able to control the storm and god was able to preserve their life number five it was a kind of faith that kept out all unbelief it kept out all unbelief i believe god i believe god it shall be even as it was told me Number six, it was a kind of faith that believed in the omnipotence of God, in the almighty, all-sufficient power of God. Number seven, it was a kind of faith that kept on believing until it received. And Paul kept on believing until he saw himself and all the other people by the seashore. Do you see that? We can have that kind of faith as well. Why? Because after all, you know this, with God, all things are possible. Is anything too hard for God to do? Jeremiah chapter 32 Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17 Ah Lord God behold thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm there is nothing too hard for thee there is nothing too hard for thee there is nothing too hard for our God almighty God in verse 27 behold I am the Lord the God of all flesh, is there anything to add for me? Is there anything to add for me? Is there anything to add for our God? In Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, verse 37, For with God nothing shall be impossible. That ought to settle every doubt in your mind. That ought to settle every suggestion of the devil in your mind. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. As He promised to save us, nothing shall be impossible. As He promised to give us victory over sin, nothing shall be impossible. As He promised to sanctify us and make us holy and make us live in holiness all the days of our lives, nothing shall be impossible. As He given us precious, great, exceedingly great and precious promises to become partakers of the divine nature, nothing shall be impossible. As he promised us that we are going to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust, nothing shall be impossible. As he giving us the promise of all things pertaining unto life and godliness, nothing shall be impossible. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. As he giving us the promise of an eternal inheritance and the promise of the gift of the Holy Ghost and the promise of healing and deliverance and dominion as he promised us the abundant life he said i have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly as he giving us as he promised us eternal life abundant life nothing shall be impossible for with god nothing shall be impossible and so we need to understand that if we will believe in god he will fulfill his promises in our lives now we go to point number three point number three full redemption through unwavering faith full redemption today through unwavering faith we're looking at romans chapter 4 from verse 22 to verse 25 and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him 
but for us also but for us also but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that traced up jesus our lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification here we are told that all this is were studied about abraham that the benefits of faith were not limited to abraham in fact all this is are written for us because it is for our benefit also see this passage and see how it now makes um, a transition from abraham unto those of us who are living today it says in verse 22 it was imputed to him for righteousness then it tells us in verse 23 it was not written for his sake alone but it's written for us verse 24 that we now can believe on him that raised up jesus and then he calls him jesus our lord jesus our lord not only their lord but our lord and then he says he was delivered for our offenses all our sins everything you can put it back together jesus can take everything away he has become our savior he has become a substitute he has become a sin bearer and you see you don't have to bear the guilt of your sin the load of your sin in fact nobody here listening to my voice now ever needs to say i am not saved i'm not saved because you see right now you can make a transfer of all your sin everything you ever committed until this very moment you can put it on the lord jesus christ not only that you can claim grace for the rest of your life from that lord jesus christ you transfer all your past sins unto him and he becomes your sin bearer because he has been delivered for our offense and then you claim from him you receive from him grace abundant grace overflowing grace continual grace so that now it will be your justifier and you'll be secured in him you see that we can have all that in fact this is why the lord has promised us abundant life if we just believe if we just believe the, the moment you believe everything becomes yours in john chapter 10 verse 10 john chapter 10 verse 10 the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy i am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly i am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly you see you can have that abundant life where you are not falling and rising falling and rising where you live a consistent life a happy life a joyful life a fruitful life a spiritual life a fulfilled life where you have that life in christ because of the grace of god that is given unto you in third epistle of john third epistle of john verse two third john verse two beloved i wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as i so prospered here we have the description of the full redemption it says number one as thy soul prospered it is well with your soul your sins are forgiven eternal life is yours christ is abiding in you your name is in the book of life you are enjoying your relationship with the lord that's the promise we're given it is yours by faith your soul prospered not only that that you be in health that you be in health even as i so prospered that means also that you will be healthy no sickness will be in your bone in your blood system in any part of your body no sickness will be in your head that you will be so healthy even as you so prospered not only that it says that thou mayest prosper he also means your physical material normal daily need you see that is the promise of god and it is part of the full redemption we have in christ if you will only believe it is yours for the believing in romans chapter 8 and verse 32 romans chapter 8 verse 32 it says he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things now you can see the promise of the lord that everything now is yours everything is now available for you this is a kind of faith that the lord expects from every one of us so that we will be able to possess it is yours today you see the lord has given us full redemption 
you see the promises of God that we have all these promises if we believe them they will give us the fulfillment of everything the Lord has made available for us you can call upon the Lord today and all these things will be yours if you have not been born again why not if you have not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, why not? If you have not understood, if you have not experienced the forgiveness of all your sins, why not now? Why not now? Because whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Rise up on your feet and call upon the name of the Lord. The promises of God are yours. You can be saved right now. You see, it is just when you say, God has accomplished it through Jesus Christ. I believe it. I accept it. The promise of God has said so. That settles it. I am saved. It doesn't depend upon your feeling. It doesn't depend upon your human ability. I believe it. I accept it. That settles it. I believe it. I believe it. I've handed over myself to the Lord. I've given myself over unto the Lord. I believe Jesus is mine. I believe I'm saved. That settles it. It's the same thing with sanctification. He wants to purify your heart. He wants to circumcise your heart. He wants to cleanse you, make you holy. He wants to purify you completely so that you'll be able to serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness before God all the days of your life. He has promised it. Why don't you exercise the kind of faith we see in the life of Abraham and receive it even now? Even now, every one of us should be praying now. The leaders should be praying. The workers should be praying. The members should be praying. Even the ushers, everyone should be praying. You need the fulfillment of the promise of God in your life. It will be yours. Because, you know, if you don't believe, it will not be yours. If you don't believe, nobody can give it to you without faith. It is of faith. It is of faith. That it might be sure to all the seed. This is the time to really abandon every other thing. Forget every other thing. And pray for yourself. And make sure you are saved. And make sure you have the victory in your life. Make sure you are sanctified, you are made holy. Make sure that you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Sealing is also available. Make sure that all these things are yours. As you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be yours. As you hold on to the Lord and you will not let him go. You say, God, it is mine. I claim it. I stand upon it. I receive it. I'm going to enjoy it. It is yours as you believe. Call upon the name of the Lord and believe with unwavering faith. Then you go home with the spiritual eternal blessing of the Lord.